So right here, this loop is going to repeat mm -hmm. until this is true. Until yeah. the what you're listening to is the sound of my robotics classroom near the end of the semester when students are working on their final projects. Mm -hmm. Play this sound. Play this sound. If it's I think one of the reasons robotics is my favorite class to teach is because it is so project-based. There's virtually no lecturing, and most of the time I give the students their project, I give them their rubric, and then I give them a due date. And the rest of the time it's them working on it and me going from student to student just checking so cool. You gotta figure out how many notes you want to play and then yeah. do some math to figure out how big each little section's gotta be based on those notes. Yep. Okay. This is the Tom Gibson Podcast, episode number two. I'm still trying to figure out the direction of this podcast, but for the time being, it is stories from the classroom. And in today's story, it is the stories from my robotics classroom. The final project is anything the students want to create. We had a student that was building an electric guitar. And here, or if it's if it's less than this much, mm -hmm. play this sound. Play this sound. If it's we had a student that was building his own whack-a-mole. So basically, I have this hammer where this motor goes up here and it pushes this up so it stays up there. And then with this, I go bam and it's down. We had a student that was building an etch-a-sketch. Like I've never really used an etch-a-sketch before. Okay. But so let's pull up YouTube and see what it looks like. I guess the big challenge for computer science and maybe any subject is figuring out how much to help the students, how much to let them productively struggle without just telling them what to do. And so in the robotics class, that turns into two different areas that I got to figure out how I want to help the student. The first area is the building. Some students are building using instructions. Do you remember if you built it from scratch or did you use instructions? I use instructions. No, Devin and I tried to build it from scratch, but it didn't really It's kind of hard. And some students had an idea and they just improvised the build as they went. Um, so I made the first shooter mechanism. I'm trying to make the second, but there's only one of these like capacity things in that kit. So I'm gonna have to improvise and make a different like holder for the ammo. The ones using instructions, I'll generally look at what they have, look at the instructions, and try to point out where I see they took a wrong turn. Instead of there, I try there. But that's not what the instructions Are you sure that's not what that says? <laughs> no. Because then this lines up right perfectly with that one right there. <gasps> you can do it, Tommy. No. Okay, uh, it. You can do it. <laughs> no. Tommy, you believe it. Look right here. Huh? On this side yeah. needs to be the empty one. This one doesn't have an empty one. Okay. So, wait. Good luck. No, Tom. Good luck, Tom. Oh. I mean, Eric. <laughs> I said good luck. The programming aspect is a little bit more challenging, particularly with students who have very little programming experience. I have to figure out what they want to do and what is going to be a good way based on their experience to make that happen. I try to do this mainly with asking them questions, telling them to test certain things out and letting them troubleshoot. Okay, what's happening with the right? Okay. Right creates an up and down line. And if you go that way, it's going to go down. Yeah. Let's just start with the right one. Delete one of the other ones. Uh, hold on. I need to figure out which one is. I would experiment. I would feed this into one of these that is going to control the Y. And then I'm going to run the program and I'm going to do this with the Y and I'm going to see what shows up on the screen. But sometimes it'll just turn into a mini lesson where I explain how a switch works or I explain how a loop works or I give them a starting point. So you're going to have to kind of have like a switch inside of another switch inside of another switch to say if it is this but it's not that and try to let them go from there but an interesting thing that happened from recording this audio for the podcast was that i was beginning to notice like i think i'm helping them a little bit more than i realize in yeah, the moment in okay so right here this loop is going to repeat we don't really need to worry until about this is true we need until the distance degrees. is equal to 50 inches okay so that way you have so that so what i do for the good let's say i put a button Point there. There just so you can and then see I'm moving at the point. <laughs> And so that balance of wanting to help and not wanting to do too much for them uh, is kind of always present in my mind. Students are able to go through the iterative process over and over again so by building. This piece, right? And it says it goes here. I, I just figured out that it might be going here, but I don't know for. Okay. That's right. And programming. I I do, and then I have to like code it and all that stuff. And testing. Uh, push play and see what happens. 
put here. Let me just play just... while it's plugged in. Let me. And building some more. Okay. This side in, and then when you reconnect this one, plug it in on that one. Okay. That actually works. Wow. And tweaking the program. So you basically figured out the basic function. It's a really simple code. Yeah, but I need. A, I want to like add more. Like right. you can't go outside the screen, but I would not know how you do that. And testing some more. Is that what you want? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Generally, until time runs out and the due date arrives. I actually think I'm almost done. I I just connected this, and I think that's pretty much the last step. I At the end of the final project, okay. they get the opportunity to share the process, and I tell them not to stress out whether or not they completed their project to the extent that they thought they did, but mainly I'm looking for what they learned. I'm looking for the struggles that they overcame. I'm looking for the challenges that they weren't able to overcome in the time being, and so they reflect on questions like what their original idea so was. The original plan was to make a race car. But after some thought and influence from people, I thought it was not a great idea because it's kind of stupid. And plus, you know, we had just done that in Sumo Bots, kind of. So I switched over to this. Their biggest aha so, moment. Um, another thing that I was able to add, like an actual etch sketch that I think is cool, is that unlike the you know, shaking it and erasing everything, you just press the middle button and everything is like gone. The only thing is that it doesn't reset uh, where it starts, like at its origin point. For some if they would have done anything differently. I would probably like go to more office hours because I kind of did this last minute a little bit. Um, like would you have done anything different with this? I would make it move, like I can make, make her like a mo remote control and put motors there. Explaining how their code works and why they wrote it the way they did. And it plays a certain note based off of what the gyro sensor sees. So like how far it is, or ultrasonic sensor, like based off of how far away it is, it'll play a certain note. And just showcasing what their robot can do if they were able to get to the point where it accomplished some kind of so task. So we can play. That's <laughs> 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 not a note. So we can play like one, one, two, three, four, four. Okay. Fire! That didn't go far. It's okay. Yeah. So Is that your first test then? Okay. And I'm actually glad I did something, I, I would call it cool. Yeah. yeah. I didn't study computer science in college. I studied audio engineering, but when I got to the school, in addition to the math classes that I had signed on for, they asked if I'd be willing to be the robotics teacher as well. And I was like, sure. And I knew I could probably learn enough to teach a beginner course. And so occasionally I will get a student in the class that far exceeds my computer science knowledge. And so a lot of these projects I've designed to be pretty open-ended so that beginners and advanced students can find something that's gonna be challenging for them. And I had one such student uh, two years ago in sixth grade who learned how to program his robot using a PlayStation 3 remote. And then this year he was an eighth grader and was back in robotics. Uh, and he decided that his final project was going to be a robot hand that he would build with the Lego EV3 kits and it would move based on the sensors that he put on a glove. Yeah, it didn't end up working or it sort of works but doesn't at the same time. Well, his dad does work with computers and kind of helped him come up with the idea of how he wanted to approach doing the programming and everything. Uh, he was able to articulate all the things that he did and why they worked and why they and didn't. The and then I had the motor. Mm -hmm. And then in my uh, library, I had functions that did specific. It's actually making into the buffer that I would send over Bluetooth to the EV3. It's writing specific. And how these flex sensors work is they change their resistance based on how much they're bent. And so I use a thing called a voltage provider. And he talked about how he made the glove with the sensors that would control the robot via Bluetooth and the issues that he ran into with that. A really hard thing that I didn't think about is that I sewed them on, or my mom sewed them on, but I didn't solder them before I sewed them on, or my mom sewed them on. So I had to come and solder them like really close to this, and I was worried it was gonna like catch on fire and melt or something. And in order to build an op code, which I don't know how to do, he had to go into the EV3 source code, which I've never done before. I had to look into the actual source code of the EV3 mm -hmm. to find the correct op code. Like I didn't expect the Arduino part, like just getting the flex sensors to turn into the motor to be a hard, 
difficult thing. It was all really impressive, and I do think that if he had just two more days, he probably could have made it happen, but unfortunately, it was like the last day of the semester, and we had to wrap everything up. If I had more time, I would have made it work. <laughs> <laughs> First semester is generally more of the seventh and eighth graders that have taken robotics before, and second semester is a lot more of the sixth graders that have never taken it. So this recording was the end of December, and I am currently in the beginning of my new group of sixth graders, a lot of them who have no experience whatsoever. So it ends up being a little bit of a different dynamic, and the sixth graders end up needing a little bit more direction than the returning seventh and eighth graders who have taken robotics before. I'm considering in the future making the first semester a more advanced robotics class, where we're doing projects that we've never done before and new projects and then the second semester the the, the regular beginner robotics class that's it for episode two of the Tom Gibson podcast. My hope is that I will get more than just my own reflections and my own classroom uh, in these podcasts and hopefully get other teachers and other types of classrooms. So until the next podcast, thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to keep up with some of the other content that I have, I've got a YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Gibson EDU, like education, or you can go to TomGibson.com, T-H-O-M-G-I-B-S-O-N.com to see some of my teaching blog reflections and other content that I put out. So thank you so much for listening and hopefully I will see you in the next podcast.